Last fall, my daughter uh, ran, not yet, <laughs> sorry. Last fall, my daughter ran in, a, in the Chicago Half Marathon and uh, she completed it. She was very proud of the accomplishment and then my wife got the idea that maybe she should try to do the same. So uh, today is the Marine Corps Historic Half Marathon down in Fredericksburg and I have this fancy uh, thing through text message and I just got word that she finished and she completed the half marathon, the first and maybe the last one she'll ever run. Uh, she's not you know, huge about these things, but she decided she wanted to do it. And uh, I just got word that she finished, so I think that's great. Speaking of running, it reminds me of a story. A man goes to see the doctor. He tells the doctor, he said, you know, all I do all day is sit on the couch and watch TV, and I'm concerned that maybe this is bad for my health. And the doctor agrees. And he recommends that this man run 10 miles a day. So two weeks later, the man calls the doctor and he says, Doctor, your plan has worked perfectly since I started running. I haven't sat on the couch one time and I haven't watched one minute of television. And surprised by the success of his advice, the doctor asks, How in the world have you been able to stay off the couch and watch no television by running 10 miles a day? And the man said, It's easy. I'm 140 miles away from home. You have to do the math on that. Life is like running a race. There's a beginning and there's an end. And there's a starting point and there's a finish line. And the direction we travel determines our destination. And to make it to the end, we're gonna to have to keep running. So today's message is very simple. If you remember nothing else, just remember these two words, keep running. Life is a race. To finish it, we're going to have to follow Paul's instructions found in Hebrews chapter 12. And this is the basis for our message today. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. In this passage, Paul is telling us how to run the race of life. And in it, there are at least three things that we need to remember from the instructions. The first one is the one near the end. It says, the race marked out for us by fixing our eyes on Jesus. So point number one is this, run the right way. Now, in the 1920s, the University of California Golden Bears were America's powerhouse college football team. They were coached by Nibs Price, and they set an unprecedented record of 50 consecutive unbeaten games. By the 1928 season, they were undoubtedly the most revered team in the history of college athletics. Their star player was Roy Regals. He played both offense and defense, and Nibs Price called him the smartest player I ever coached. In the 1929 Rose Bowl, don't get ahead of me, Bill. Bill was there, that's why he knows what happened. Sorry. In the 1929 Rose Bowl, the Golden Bears faced the most formidable opponent they had ever lined up against, the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, who had just finished an undefeated season. And midway through the second quarter, the big turning point in the game. Georgia Tech's Jack Stumpy Thomason fumbled the football and no one was surprised to see Roy Regals scoop it up. Roy was just 30 yards away from the Yellow Jackets end zone. It was clear that nobody could stop him from scoring a touchdown. But Roy didn't run 30 yards. He ran 70 yards the wrong way. And teammate Benny Lom chased Regals and screamed at him to stop, and he finally caught up with him at the three-yard line and tried to turn him around, but it was too late. Roy Regals was tackled by a swarm of Yellow Jackets. After the game, Regals said, I was running towards the sideline when I picked up the ball, and I, I started to turn left towards the Georgia Tech goal, but somebody shoved me, and I bounced off a tackler. And then turning around to get away from him, I completely lost my bearings. The blunder remains the most famous case of misdirection 
in the history of sports. And for the rest of his life, poor Roy was known as Wrong Way Regals. Of course, Roy's problem wasn't running. Roy's problem was that he ran the wrong way. And as we laugh at Roy's blunder, we should be careful not to make the same mistake. And so we must ask ourselves today, are we running the right direction? Have we lost our bearings? Are we running towards the one true God or are we running towards many false ones? Psalm 16 says, the sorrow of those will increase who run after other gods. Going back to Hebrews 12, are we running the race marked out for us? Or are we caught up in the rat race? You see, we easily see the folly of the lowly hamster when it runs with all its might on a wheel that goes nowhere. And then we fill our days by running in circles and running ourselves ragged. We're constantly running late and running on empty. We're running blind and we're running ourselves into the ground. And then we're discovering that we're run down and we feel like we're running out of time. And then we are on the hamster wheel. As I said before, my daughter Jessica ran the Chicago Half Marathon last fall. She spent most of her summer training for the race, and she ran most of those training runs around our neighborhood, and she was using her uh, phone with an app on it that has a GPS, and it tracks all your distance and time. Well, we went on vacation last summer for a week, and on vacation, her only real option was just to run on the treadmill in the hotel. So I went with her to the hotel gym. That's not her, by the way. That's just a cartoon. I tried to find the silliest picture I could find. I went with her to the hotel gym so she could run on the treadmill and uh, she put her headphones on and started running and after she'd been running about 15 minutes she pulled her headphones out and she looked at me incredulously and she said, my running GPS isn't working. I've been running for 15 minutes and it says I haven't gone anywhere. The GPS, as it turns out, was working perfectly. Although she was running, she wasn't going anywhere. And like a hamster on a wheel, constant running might make us feel like we're making progress. But if we're not running the course God has marked out for us, we too may be going nowhere. Proverbs 14 says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So first point, let us run towards God and let us run the race marked out for us by fixing our eyes on Jesus. And so we turn to Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And another passage says this, listen my son, accept what I say and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction and do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked. Do you have that verse up there? Have you ever had your printer not print the whole thing? All right, and if it's not up there, I'll just finish it. Don't set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of the evil. Avoid that road. Do not travel on it. That's Proverbs 4, by the way. And another passage from Psalm 119. Now, for this one, I went to the message translation because I love how the message puts it in terms that it's hard for us to avoid. Psalm 119 says this, You are blessed when you stay on the course, walking steadily on the road revealed by God. You're blessed when you follow His directions, doing your best to find Him. That's right. You don't go off on your own. You walk straight along the road, He said. You, God, prescribed the right way to live, and now you expect us to live it. Oh, that my steps might be steady, keeping to the course you set. Then I'd never have any regrets in comparing my life with your counsel. 
I thank you for speaking straight from your heart. I learn the pattern of your righteous ways. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. How can a young person live a clean life? By carefully reading the map of your word. God's word is the map that gives us directions for the race. The course has been marked out for us. And we must follow it if we are to finish. Okay, second point. It's a long race. It's a long race. You know, we might be running the right way, but we won't see the finish line until the very end. Which means that there are going to be times when you might think that you won't make it. My dad always reminds me that life is what happens when you're making other plans. And life is run on God's timing and not ours. And sometimes we won't be able to recognize all the signs along the way. We have to keep faith and believe that all things are working together for the good. When we are not sure what to do, the answer is to keep running. And this is going to be difficult for at least two reasons. First, for most of the race, you won't see the finish line and you won't see the reward. And so it's easy to lose faith that all you're running is not getting you closer to the prize. So back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Let us run with perseverance. With perseverance. Paul knew that he couldn't just say, let us run. He knew we would need endurance and stamina. Isaiah says this, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And Psalm 119 puts it this way, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Lamps are lit with fire. A lamp to your feet is an image for holding your feet to the fire. A constant motivation to keep running. Like walking across hot coals, you just have to keep going. The lamp, of course, is also a light for my path. But lamps as we know, only illuminate a short distance ahead. There's not enough light to see all the way to the finish. We have to trust God. We have to trust in God's guidance, which is just enough light to lead our daily path. By the way, Jessica did finish the Chicago Half Marathon, if I didn't mention that. This is a picture of her uh, with her medal. And two thumbs up. She was very excited. After the race, uh, I wanted to hear all about it. So I called her and asked her, how was it? And uh, she was excited and tired. And I was curious if there was ever a time during the race that she thought that she may not finish. And she said, yeah, there was. It was weird. I was just passing the 10-mile mark, and I felt great. And I knew that I was going to make it. And then I came around a turn. And I saw that a lot of people had started walking. I instantly felt tired. I instantly wondered if I could make it. And then I had to cut around people because they were getting in my way. The people who had stopped running created an unexpected challenge. And in order to make it, Jessica knew that she had to avoid them. And she had to ignore what they were doing. This happened in the New Testament church as well. And the Apostle Paul admonished the church in Galatia with these words when he feared that they had stopped following the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Paul said, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? As you run, some people are going to become obstacles who cut in on you or stop running. And some will quit the race completely. And in order to finish, you're going to have to ignore what some people are doing. And you're going to have to go around them. And you're going to have to keep running. Ricky Henderson played his last major league game on September 19, 2003. And throughout his unparalleled career, Ricky was known for an unquenchable passion for playing baseball and a buoyant, eccentric, and quotable personality that both entertained and perplexed fans. 
And once asked if he thought Ricky Henderson was a future Hall of Famer statistician, Bill James said, if you could split him into two, you'd have two Hall of Famers. Now, Ricky's specialty was stealing bases. When he retired, he had 1,406 career steals, which obliterated the previous record held by Lou Brock. And Ricky Henderson is the only player in baseball who ever stole more than 100 bases in a season, a feat which he accomplished three times. One time at a game against the Baltimore Orioles, Ricky Henderson looked at the opposing team's third baseman when he was on first base and held up two, right before he stole second base. When he got to second, he smiled and looked at the third baseman again, and he held up three, and he stole third. After he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, a reporter asked Ricky Henderson, what was the secret to your astounding ability to steal bases? And Ricky said this, you have to keep running. I always believed I was going to be safe. So keep running. Believe that you will be safe in the end. And then do something else that Hebrews 12 tells us to do. Throw off all that hinders. Back to our verse in Hebrews. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. As we run the race of life, we often load ourselves with stuff. Stuff that we think we might need and sin that we're pretty sure we know. And as the race goes on, the stuff weighs us down and holds us back from the finish. And often we find ourselves unwilling or unable to throw it off. One runner of marathons gave this advice on her blog. She said that people carry too much stuff at the beginning of a marathon. Things that are unnecessary. And she warned against it saying that it might seem like a good idea. But as the race drags on, you're going to want to toss all that stuff. Because it's weighing you down. So she has a simple rule. She never spends more than $20 on anything she wears or carries. That way, she can throw it off at any point without too much concern. Her goal is to finish. And she has learned that weighing herself down with expensive junk will only get in the way. So as you run the race, be careful not to invest too much time in things that are only wearing you down. Because a time will come when you will have to choose between keeping the things you have invested in or throwing them off in order to finish the race. Be careful where you invest your time and energy and your resources. And Jesus warned about this on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And that brings us to the third point, and it goes like this. There's a reward at the end of the race. 1 Corinthians 9 says this, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now if you notice, he says everyone who competes in the games, the games Paul re is referring to here are the Isthmian games, which were well known and the subject of great patriotic pride to the Corinthians. These games were held in the years just before and after the Olympic Games. And for Greeks, they were not an amusement, but they were a passion. And some of the games included chariot races, and there was wrestling and boxing. And then they had a game called Pankration, which was basically boxing and wrestling, except that there were no rules. They also had musical and poetical contests, which I'm sure that uh, Jesse and I would have entered in, I'm sure, unless you're a boxer 
or a wrestler. Pancreation? Nothing. All right. Of course, the most highly anticipated part of the games was the foot race. And Paul refers to the crown that they would have received for winning the Isthmian Games foot race. And it was a crown that was literally made up of green parsley leaves. And Paul made a simple point that everyone of the day would have understood. A crown of parsley leaves is not going to last. And then he says, there's an everlasting crown. It's waiting for you at the finish line of the Christian journey. And all you have to do is get there. Proverbs 2 says, he holds victory in store for the upright. God has already secured the victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is how Paul describes the finish line. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And where, O oh, death, is your victory? And where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? In 2 Timothy, he describes the finish line like this, by saying, I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Victory is guaranteed. A crown is awaiting us at the finish line where all who have gone before us line the way. So now we're back to Hebrews 12. The very beginning of the passage says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. If you think about it, at any race, the biggest crowd is where? They're at the finish line. And this is where most people gather. It is the place where all the people who have finished the race before us are also waiting. In the race of life, this is the cloud of witnesses. And they're ready to cheer us on to victory in Jesus Christ. All the saints and all those who have died in Christ and all of your loved ones and all of mine, they're there right now. And they're cheering us on to finish and to receive our crown. Philippians 3 says this, Not that I have already attained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One final story, and then I'm done. Heather Dornadin grew up in the Twin Cities metropolitan area in a town called Rosemount. At Rosemount High School, Heather's first love was music, and she excelled at playing the flute. But her other passion was running. While at Rosemount, Heather won the Minnesota class AA state title in the 400 meter and the 800 meter races. And she was on track for some music scholarships at various schools, but then she realized that she could parlay her running talent into a scholarship at the University of Minnesota. And Heather became a star at Minnesota, a nine time All American runner. She became the highest decorated Minnesota Gopher women's track athlete in school history, holding nine separate records in nine events. March 1, 2008, and Heather is leading the Minnesota Gopher team in the Big Ten Indoor Championships. It's time for the 600-meter race, and Heather is the favorite. 
She begins the race back in the pack and waits for the right time to make her move to the front. The race is very short. It's only three laps long. In essence, it's a full-on sprint to the finish. And so as she comes to the final lap, the lap that they call the bell lap, she makes her move to the front. And she takes the lead. But in an instant, everything changes. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I couldn't believe it when I first saw that video. After the race, Heather said, I told myself before the start that all things are possible through Christ. And first and foremost, I sing credit his way. She said, immediately after the fall, I said one thing to myself, get up and, and at least get a time that will score. My team, coaches, family, and tons of fans, they were just going crazy when I got up and started running. And I felt like their energy filled me up. I heard everyone cheering me on, and I told myself, I can get back in the race. And coming around the final curve, I overheard the announcer saying, watch out for Heather. It got me pretty pumped up. And the rest is history. I don't know where you are in life's race today. Maybe you can't see the finish line. And you don't hear the cheers. Or maybe you stopped running a long time ago. Or perhaps you've been running in the wrong direction. Maybe you were once on the right path and you might have even taken the lead. But just when you got to the front, you stumbled and you fell flat on your face. Remember, there's a cloud of witnesses who've gone ahead of you and they believe that you can make it. They see you and they surround you. And when you fall, they are saying to you, get up. Get up and keep running. You can get back in the race and you can finish and you can win.